Welcome back. It is time for another enthralling edition of Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original sports podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. Hey, everybody. I am Scott Cobranton, your host, along with my partner in crime, the man, not even the myth anymore. Now he is like a legend. Midtown Mo, Mr. Mo Moten. Uh, he is the educational NFL writer at Bleacher Report, so he covers the entire league. You can catch his stuff up there. You can also catch his Raiders content on sportsnot.com, where he is a Raiders columnist. Yes, he's so big that not one website can contain him. Mo, good to see you, man. How was your weekend? Are you ready? You ready for the combine for some of this stuff that's going to – it's lying season, yes, but we're going to actually see some results now. Right. This is the kind of the first taste of NFL prospects for a lot of people. You know, majority of people are, aren't cramming film and watching these <laughs> prospects. So it's their first real look at, you know, guys who are going to throw the combine among the quarterbacks, guys who are going to do the broad jump, long jump, run their 40s, uh, bench press for the for the guys in the trenches, the offensive linemen, defensive linemen. So I think this is kind of like the first for some people, this is kind of the first taste into NFL draft season, which is exciting. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. Of course, now this is where I, I want to say to people too, because it's funny. I've I, I've been tweeting stories out and this kind of stuff, and the reaction is so funny. Oh, this is crap. Or oh, this is this is sounds good. And it's it's funny because people are like, well, it doesn't mean anything. And in in fact, it really doesn't. Right until you start doing things. But I will say this week, and I'm going to be up at the combine starting on Tuesday through Sunday. So I'll be there uh, almost every single day, except with the exception of Friday. Uh, so I'll be at the press conferences. I'll be there. I'll kind of get the skinny of what's going on. We'll hear what's going on. But Mo, we talked about it last time. This is where deals start happening. They can't be consummated officially until March 14th, but they. this is where it starts. This is where trades start. This is where trades in the draft start. This is where free agent conversations, because Yes, there's fans of the combine, and there's obviously a crap ton of media, but really, this is where executives, coaches, scouting, front office people are there, and they get to kind of intermingle and start to work on things in person before they all go back to their respective uh, locations and prepare for the draft. So I anticipate a very busy week, and, and hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll do the show, by the way, Wednesday. I'll do the show from the combine as well, so we'll get you up to date on the latest of what we're hearing with the Raiders, but this is where it all starts happening, though. It's funny because, you know, there's this legal tampering period for the NFL when teams can reach out to players. But we all know the truth that, as you said, at the combine, that's when all the deals are talked about. Yeah. Usually a group of the media writers and reporters kind of get together and kind of share notes on you know, what they've been hearing. And that's how you get these stories after the combine about such and such has been talked about in trade discussions. Such and such might be uh, cut or released. That's where it all comes yeah. from. Of course, it's separate from the actual coaches and general managers having their discussions at wherever they're eating at, whatever restaurant they're at. But it's always an exciting time because of the rumor mill that comes out after the combine. Yes, that is exactly what. So so I will be in smack in the middle of it and try to uh, get Raider Nation here some some notes and some information. Although I think, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward what we've seen in the last few days as far as news goes. First, I want to address and I want to get your thoughts. The Raiders coaching staff is now complete. They announced it officially um, this week with with a list of all of the coaches. In case we kind of knew almost everybody that was that was going to be joining Antonio Pierce's staff. Of course, he is the head coach, the assistant head coach, Marvin Lewis. Matt Sheldon is a game management coach. We know Luke Getze. Edgar Bennett is back as wide receivers coach. You have James Craig coming over to coach the offensive line. Joe Philbin. We talked about him a little bit, senior offensive assistant. DeAndre Pierce, the coach's son, is the offensive assistant. And we talked about Rich Scangaro as well as the quarterback's coach. Um, anybody here surprise you? Anybody excite you as far as the coaching staff? It's hard, right? Because most people, again, too, unless you're talking about OC or DC, most fans don't know deeply about the coaching staff, especially from the position standpoint, other than guys that have been there for a while. But any anything that surprised you or anything that sticks out for you? Well, the Raiders didn't get Clint Kubiak, who was with the 49ers staff under Kyle Shanahan. Uh, mm -hmm. He's going to New Orleans. But um, they did get, uh, I believe it was James Craig, who was the – who was an offensive line coach over with the San Francisco 49ers. Yep. So 
they didn't get exactly Kubiak, but they still got a, a, a Shanahan disciple, so to speak. So I, I expect the Raiders to have a lot of outside zone run plays, mm-hmm. which is what Luke uh, Getze had in Chicago. So I kind of, the, the marriage between Luke Getze and James Craig as far as systems and schematics are concerned match up. Um, I'm not going to say that the Raiders are going to run a 49ers like offense because they don't have 49ers players, <laughs> Christian McCaffrey, but <laughs> Debo Samuel. But uh, I, I think what you're going to get is a team that's going to be a run first team, unless somebody like Kirk Cousins comes to Las Vegas. I don't see the fit there. But unless they get a, a veteran quarterback who's used to high volume passing, you're going to get a run first team, especially if you're going to have an inexperienced quarterback. And I think you're going to have uh, a system with a mobile quarterback. That's not a shot at Aiden O'Connell, but looking at Luke Getz's history, he's worked with mobile quarterbacks, and I think that will continue in Las Vegas. Yeah, and 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 that's the thing too is I think I think you look at at, at this gives you clues, right? And until the coaching staff gets their roster, to, oh yeah, by the way, a roster together, uh, it's hard to to kind of pass judgment or to understand what they may or may not do. Because they don't have the pieces all in place, and it starts with the quarterback, as you mentioned. And and I think that that's something that we're going to look into as we go into the combine, which is the Raiders have needs. You know, a lot of people want to look at it as a very simple solution or a simple equation, and that is, okay, the Raiders are close, or the Raiders are not close. But the reality is, it's somewhere in between. The Raiders, I I believe, should be a playoff team next year, based on that. All depending on what happens at quarterback. I mean, I just have to say that because even with Aiden O'Connell, who did. Okay. Again, everybody wants to, we want to temper it a little bit. He did okay last year in the situation he was in as a fourth round rookie. You have to consider all of that. But if they can, if they can get somebody in at quarterback, who's a difference maker, even if it's a rookie, then I think you start to look at that and say, okay, this team can perform there, but they also have to fill spots on the offensive line and get depth on the offensive line. They also need to fill spots on the defensive line and the defensive backfield as well. As we head into the combine, obviously story number one is going to be quarterback. I looked at the schedule, Mo. Tom Telesco speaks to the media on Tuesday morning, so I'll be there for that. But there is, it, it does not appear the Raiders are making Antonio Pierce available, which is fine. You know, the Rams don't even send anyone to the combine. So teams have different mm-hmm. approaches But with this new regime, we're obviously seeing, for whatever reason, they've decided to have Antonio Pierce either stay home or he'll be there and he just won't be speaking officially to the media. So we'll have to see which one it is. But heading into the combine, is there any bigger question uh, than quarterback? And outside of quarterback, what else do you see here for the Raiders that they really need to poke around and, and get a good sense for this draft class? The biggest question is obviously quarterback. There was a story that came out this past weekend, I guess we're going to talk about on today's show about the quarterback position and what Antonio Pierce and Tom Tusco think about their quarterback room currently. But outside of that, you mentioned it earlier or a few minutes ago, the offensive line, the Raiders have to figure out what they're going to do with their offensive line. Obviously Pierce said he wants to be able to throw the ball, but we all know that the genetic makeup of that genetic, the makeup of his football team that he wants is a physical football team. And to me, the way you build that is inside out. So you build that through the trenches, your defensive line, your offensive line. The Raiders study the defensive tackle, whether whether they bring Adam Butler, John Jenkins, and Blau Nichols back or not. I think they need to draft uh, defensive linemen, defensive tackle specifically, and offensive line. Uh, We'll see. I think they they can go after a right tackle early. Uh, Guards are usually drafted on day two, not day one, unless they have the versatility to play outside. But I assume the Raiders are going to add at least one guard, at least one tackle between free agency and the draft. So those would be two spots along the offensive line we'll look at. I assume Dylan Parham is going to shift over from guard to center. We'll see. Even if he doesn't, then you're going to have to draft a center because I don't think Andre James will be back. Uh, Other than that, you're looking at the cornerback position. I think that's a spot where... Though you're, if you're building a team inside out, cornerback is not a top priority. But to me, it's still on the list because Meek Robertson is going to be a free agent. Nate Hobbs, mm-hmm. while he can play outside, to me, he's better in the slot. You're going to have to address the cornerback position opposite Jack Jones. Yeah, and and I think that we're going to get into that next segment too. And I wrote a piece up on Sports Not as as part of our combine coverage about five cornerbacks fans should watch. And so I'll get your comments on that one too. But the quarterback question, it, it's really interesting because I, I, I see this situation and it, it's, it's, it's really interesting because 
fans will often tell those of us who do shows, whether it's podcasts, whether it's writing, whether it's radio, doesn't matter. They'll tell you guys don't know any more than anybody else. And they're right. We're making educated guesses. We look at things and we say, okay, here's what we think could happen. Uh, but at the same time, really, and you've said this last show, Mo, we don't know what the Raiders feel. If the Raiders feel that Drake May is the guy that will change forever the trajectory of the Raider franchise, they will do whatever they can to try to get to two or one to get the quarterback they want, whether it's him, whether it's Caleb Williams, doesn't matter. They will do that, and people will argue, well, you can't give up that much draft capital. You can't do this. You can't do that. Now, until something actually happens, it's hard to evaluate it. But I think that we're, we're starting to see even Peter King, who announced his retirement on Monday, by the way, longtime NFL columnist, 50 years covered the NFL. Uh, he's, he believes that, that the Bears are going to trade out. I disagree with him. He knows a lot more than I do. Okay, I'll make that fair. I just don't see the Bears doing it. But it just goes to show you that going into the combine this week and then going into the draft in a few weeks, nobody really knows. But at the end of the day, Mo, if a team wants their guy and they believe in their heart of hearts, you got to do it. They will do whatever it takes to get there. Yeah, and we'll see if the Raiders feel like it's worth moving up for a draft prospect or if they could move up for a draft prospect. Because at, at the end of the day, it takes two to tango, right? You can't right. trade up with yourself. You need a trade partner if you want to move up. And I've said this going back to, I don't know, early January, that the spot, if the Raiders are going to make a, a splash with a trade moving up, to me, the highest that they can go is probably third. Yeah, And I, cause I think there's a real possibility that the Patriots trade out. If the Patriots stay at, at three, I think it's a possibility the Raiders can st still get into the top 10 with one of the teams that may not necessarily want a quarterback in the first round, may draft a quarterback, but just not necessarily in the first round. So I think there, there are some spots between five and 10 where the Raiders can move up if they want someone who may be available and they want to leap over the Denver Broncos and Minnesota Vikings. If they stand pat at 13, I think fans should uh, embrace the idea that they may not go quarterback with their first draft pick, that they may go with a, a tackle, or I wouldn't recommend going cornerback, though they could probably get the best cornerback in the draft at 13, potentially, Terry on Arnold at Alabama. But um, <laughs> I, I think it's going to be quarterback or or a tackle, in my opinion. And if they mm. if they go corner, if they go a quarter, if they go tackle then we could possibly see them trade back the first round or get their core back in the second round, which is not out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, that's true too. Especially, I mean, if they really like a guy like Penix or Nix may fall, I, I don't know. Again, the draft is such a feel thing. Like when you get to draft day, depending on what happens above you, it, it impacts everybody picking below. So for example, our good friend Kelly Kreiner was giving me crap because I said last time that I could see Marvin Harrison <laughs> dropping and really dropping a spot or two because I could see the Cardinals, if somebody really want, if three quarterbacks, if quarterbacks go one, two, three, and somebody wants to get to four to get a quarterback, if that's the way it's going, I could see the Cardinals trading down two or three spots because they can still get Marvin Harrison. Like he can drop two spots. I'm not saying he's dropping to the second round, but you know, you just don't know what happens on that day. And I think heading into the combine, one of the things that I'm really interested to hear when I'm up there is the Vikings. The Vikings, it, it, there's a lot of coverage coming out now. A lot of people saying the Vikings are really thinking about being aggressive and moving up to get a quarterback. Boy, that changes things, right? Because the Vikings were not a team, especially if they do re-sign Cousins, you're not a, they're not a team you think about. We continue to see our good friends who cover the Giants saying that the Giants are interested in a quarterback. So, so it could be really, really messy, and the Raiders might have to pay a lot, but if they feel it's worth it, they can do it. And when the quarterback, cornerbacks, which we'll talk about in the next segment, um, there are some really good ones. It's a good class, and so you're right. I could see them very easily if, if, those, if they cannot get up, if they love a guy and they still can't get up there to get him in that top of the first round, very easily see them going offensive lineman uh, or even cornerback um, at in the first round because those are all impact players and those are all positions of great need for the Raiders. Uh, and so, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to hear and see who the Raiders spend time with at the combine. It at least give us some hints. It's not going to give us the answers, but that'll tell us a little bit about maybe some of the direction they're going uh, Mo, when, when we see sort of who they're, they're focusing in on up in Indianapolis. So just remember that, 
offensive line men usually don't make headlines. They're not catching touchdown <laughs> passes. They're not rushing for touchdowns. Yeah. But if you listen to Antonio Pierce, and I listened to Antonio Pierce's full interview with Ryan Clark, Fred Taylor, mm-hmm. Channing Crowning on the pivot, it's clear to me he wants to build a bully. And yeah. if you look at the division, right, the one the one weakness that I saw in the in the Chiefs is that you can run the ball on. You know, there, there are times where you can control the line of, skin, of scrimmage against the Chiefs. When the Raiders beat the Chiefs, I know they did it with two defensive touchdowns, but they did it with a, with a physical nature, right? Mm-hmm. You got Harbaugh going to the Los Angeles Chargers. What does he usually do when he gets to a football team? Immediately turns into a physical team. Yes. So I think Antonio Pierce is going gonna, is gonna to want to build a bully in the AFC West. And the way you do that, and I'll repeat this again and again until the draft, the way you build a bully is through the trenches. Yep. So I feel like if, if it's not quarterback, it has to be someone on a defensive or offensive line for the Rays that they pick at 13, assuming they stay at 13. And I think that's where they're going to go. So I'm going to be talking a lot about offensive linemen. And people are going to say, I know there are a lot of people out there who are fans of Thayer Mumford Jr. But let's be honest. Thayer Mumford Jr. hasn't done enough to say that he's the bona fide starter there at right tackle. Jermaine Luminar, we'll see what happens. He's going to be a free agent. A lot of Jets fans want Jermaine Luminar, by the way. Mm-hmm. I, I think the Raiders go with a, with another tackle to say, okay, we, now we have our bookend tackles in Colt Miller and maybe whoever they draft to protect our quarterback, whoever that is going to be. Yeah, and, and that's where I think, too, Mo, that that people, like you said, it, it's not sexy to talk about offensive line, but I think, I think Raider fans – no sort of and they've heard from antonio pierce and i'm I'm glad you brought that up because i think antonio pierce has told us who he wants to be who he wants this team to be so listen listen to him right Mm -hmm. and and that gets into a little bit of the controversy we saw last week towards the end of the week uh, related to that interview which was this idea that and and of course pro football talk jumps on and says well they might hear from the nfl because antonio pierce basically said he wants to uh, and I'm paraphrasing because he didn't exactly say it. he wants to rip off Mahomes. He wants to basically rip off the head of the snake, so to speak. He wants to f- be physical. And you know what? When you look at the Chiefs, when they have been beat, whether it be in the Super Bowl, or the playoffs, regular season, teams are successful when they rattle Patrick Mahomes and they're very physical. So I don't put any stock into this. Well, he said something like the bounty gate. Oh, BS. Let's you know. And, and I'm not here to. I'm not here to, you know, rah, rah, fan AP. I'm just telling you it was overblown. And I will tell you this. The one thing I've learned, and I've not been around him, right, physically. The one thing I've learned about Antonio Pierce Mo is that he's one smart dude. He does everything with purpose. And so the, he knew when he would say something like that, that it would it would raise the ire of people. And but more than anything, he wants his team to believe what he's been preaching to them, which is we are going to be physical. We're going to have ill intent and we're going to uh, win football games, like you said, in the trenches and by being physical. Now, we see all these stories. Well, now the refs are really going to watch the race. BS. If they don't do anything that's not illegal, they're going to be fine. It has nothing to do with illegal things. People jump to that. And in reality, this is about beating up your your opponent on the lines in the trenches and getting to the quarterback to disrupt him because you can't beat Patrick Mahomes without disrupting. It was the most overblown story I think I've seen in a long time. I have two thoughts about this, right? One, yes, it was overblown because I think what happened with Antonio Pierce and his comments is he said the quiet part out loud, <laughs> right? So what team yes, playing sir. against the Chiefs? What team playing against the Chiefs doesn't? say we have to rough up Patrick Mahomes to win this football game. I right. think that's the game plan of most teams playing the Chiefs. Of course. You got to get Patrick Mahomes on the ground. Now, they don't say that part to the public, and this is why coaches and general managers don't talk to media much because everything can be taken out of context or taken and mm-hmm. blown up way out of proportion. But Antonio Pierce basically said the quiet part that he says to his team, they preach to his team every week out loud. I'm sure Dan Campbell says the same thing to his players. Of course. I'm sure the 49ers, before they played the Chiefs, said the same thing to their players. Look, we got to rough up Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. But he said it to the media for it to be used as, <laughs> you know, content. And now everyone's like, oh, my gosh, they're trying to kill Patrick Mahomes. Not, not literally, but they're trying to. You know, put him in the ground. Now, I will say this on the other side of it is that Antonio Pierce has to be careful because I do think that his comments draw attention to the Raiders and put not put a bullseye on them, but it people remember comment. We're all human, right? Sure. So sure. people are going to remember what Antonio Pierce says. So any call that's on the line in the gray area, 
it may work against Rays because remembering those comments, they say, well, this team is going to play physical. They're going to play kind of rough. You know how refs do. Let's be honest about refs. They, sometimes they want to control the football game. We yes. want to make sure things don't get out of hand. So we're going to call early penalties. We're going to call the game tight so that things don't go too far over the line. Yeah, it's a yep. physical game, but we're going to make sure it stays within the, within the within the guidelines of the rules. So I think that's something to be careful of, that when you're talking to the media, be careful about what you say, because things do become a story that are not really a story. Mm-hmm. And because of the human element, referees are human they could take some of these comments and say, well, this team has a history of being physical. Antonio Pierce wants to be physical. Let's call the game a certain way. And you have to be careful about that because we all know the league is trying to protect quarterbacks. I'm just saying Absolutely. you got to be, you got to be, you got to be mindful of that. Absolutely. And and that's true. So, so you know, if you're, if you're the Raiders and you play the chiefs, everybody's seen these comments now, right? And they, like you said, they won't forget them. So yeah. if you go in and you sack the quarterback and you land on him, guess what? Yeah. They're going to call, even if it's close, yeah. they're going to call it on you. Yeah. So, that's fine though. He's made that trade off. The other thing I want to mention before we hit the break here with these comments and and I don't have any problem with it because at the end of the day Antonio Pierce to me appears to be supremely confident that he's ready to take this team and make a jump. Great. Sounds good. Fans are excited about it. It's awesome. But I will tell you this. The Chiefs three Super Bowls in the last 5 years, 6 years, right? So, guess what? Now you've basically said to them, we're going to come beat you. You've given them bulletin board fodder. So the Raiders, when they play the Chiefs, got to be ready. (laughs) Now, I'm not saying they don't have to be ready for the rest of the teams, Mo, but this is your division rival. And so now, and and again, they're the best team in football with the best quarterback in football. This is the way it is, as much as Raider Nation hates that. So when you play the Chiefs, you better come out and play them next year because now you've you've basically said, we're coming after you. And and you got to be and and as Antonio Pierce says, my resume is on the grass. Your resume against the Chiefs on the grass as a franchise over the last ten years has not been good. Now it got better on Christmas Day. That's one win. That does not make a renewed rivalry. That does not make a streak. You now have to prepare yourself and be ready. And Mo, that's the other piece of it here. It's great game and gamesmanship, but this is a good team. We'll see what happens with the Chiefs in the offseason and what happens with the Raiders. But man, you're gonna have to you're you're walk you're, you're talking the talk. You got to walk the walk too. Yeah, but this is it. This is Antonio Pierce. This is who he, I, yes, I think listening absolutely. to Antonio Pierce that, talk. Of course, right? He he's not gonna make any. You know, I I, I would say he's, he's gonna, gonna make it known. Dramatic. He's not. He's gonna make it known <laughs> that he's coming after you. So that yes. I expect. That's who Antonio Pierce is. If yep. he's coming after you, he's gonna tell you, "I'm coming after you. I'm gonna knock your head off." Exactly. So that's. And that's what he wants his team to reflect. I think when I listen to the pivot, again, if you haven't listened to the pivot with Antonio Pierce, listen to that hour and nine seconds. You learn a lot about what he wants this Raider team to be. That he wants this team, this organization to be a reflection of him. So when he mm-hmm. talks like that to the media and he talks tough and physical, he, he's expecting his team to hear that. I think when you talk to the media in that type of setting or in any setting, A lot of times coaches want to send messages to their players through the media. Yes. So, yeah, you send messages to them one-on-one. You have team meetings. You talk to them privately, whatever. But there are certain times where you can get a message across by saying something to the media, knowing that it's going to catch waves and catch headlines because that catches people's attention. Like, oh, this guy is, you know, he really means what he says. He doesn't just say it to us. He says it to the public. So it's real. So I think when he talks the way he talks, very straightforward, telling the Chiefs that we're coming after you. I think that build that goes into what he's trying to build in Las Vegas. Now he's one that I will say, while the rivalry has been lopsided between the Raiders and the Chiefs, Antonio Pierce is one and one against the Chiefs with an impressive win against yeah. them on Christmas Day. So, so I could see why he's confident that he could take down the Chiefs. Sure, he's, he's done it. He's done it before. He's demystified it. Right. He's demystified it for the for that team. So so if you're a Raider right now and we'll see what happens with the roster, the last experience you had with the world champions was you beat the crap out of them. So so I get that. And that's how fans feel, too. So I understand it. Um, And when we come back, we'll talk a little more about that, too, about the quarterback situation. We're also going to get into I wrote a piece up on Sports Not about cornerbacks. So I'm going to try to convince Mo that the Raiders, if they don't get a quarterback in the first round, they should get a cornerback before they get a tackle. We'll see if I can convince them. Uh, but when we get back, we're going to talk about that here on Silver and Black today. We're in full off-season mode, but we got the combine come up. I'm excited to be up there, and we will be doing our show from there Wednesday 
Mo will be at his lair in New York City, but we will be doing that live from the combine as long as internet holds up. So we'll uh, come back after this message here on Silver and Black today and Odyssey Sports original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. And welcome back to Silver and Black today, a show we talk about some football team that wears silver and black. I forgot what their name is. No, the Las Vegas Raiders, of course. Back with you, Scott Branson, along with my partner, Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. Oh, by the way, follow him on x.com at Mo Moten. Mo, I got, you know how many messages I got from people when you went on your dark retreat? We're like, is Mo okay? He, ha he hasn't tweeted in like five days. Is, is everything okay? And, and it all comes from a good place. I'm not making fun of the concern. But people were reaching out and saying, is, is he all right? Is he okay? Because because you're out there and people interact with you. You We interact with people all the time. And so I said, no, he's fine. He's just taking some time away. He's, he's decompressing. You know, it's been a long football season. They all are. And we have a very short period of time where we don't have football, which is like two weeks after the Super Bowl, not even really a week after the Super Bowl. And then we get June, right? <laughs> That's pretty much it without a ton of stuff going on uh, in, in the league. So – just just know people care about you, Mo. And they were concerned. They thought maybe you had some bad cheesecake. <laughs> you know, they, they weren't really sure what happened, but uh everybody was 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 uh, checking in on you, which is which is nice. So, but you can follow him there at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-U-N. Go ahead, Mo. Yeah, I, I've been I would say very short on on social media lately. Usually at this time between the Super Bowl and I would say the combine. You use the word decompress, and I use that that word with a lot of my inner circle friends that sometimes, not sometimes, a lot of times after the season, I just kind of decompress, mm -hmm. and I just kind of step away. Mm -hmm. I do some studying, less talking, more studying, because you know I, I'll be transparent here. I'm not watching every co collegiate prospect during the <laughs> NFL season because I'm an NFL guy. Right. Right? I'm mostly an NFL guy, so I do watch college games during the season, but I'm not watching every snap of – of BYU, correct? You know, yeah. and BYU's got a tackle coming out in this year's draft. There is may look at, you know, who knows? But I, I'm not watching every game of the college football season, so I have some catching up to do after the NFL season's over. And when it comes to the combine, when it comes to who the Raiders may draft, a lot of people put out these mock drafts, and they have no idea what direction the Raiders are going in, and they have no idea who these collegiate right. prospects are. They just put up certain prospects because that prospect's name is popular. I don't like to do that. I, I like to have my own opinion based on what I've seen, based on what I've studied, based on what I know about the Raiders. And I like to have my own type of mock drafts and who the Raiders should look at. It's not following along with the herd of what everyone else is saying. So when my mock drafts come out, they may not look like everyone else's. I don't have a mock draft out yet for that reason, because I'm still studying mm -hmm. and trying to get the best idea of what the Raiders could do so I can give my readers and my audience the best informed opinions that I have. Again, I'm not in the Raiders rooms. So I don't know what they're going to do, mm -hmm. but these are just educated opinions. Correct. And that's, that's the thing too. And everybody has them. And to me, that's like you, I mean, during the college season, especially I try to focus on things that I think will be relevant. Now that I'm working at sports, not obviously I'm covering the, the entire league as well, even though I focus a lot on the Raiders. So, so I, I tend to pay more attention, but I tend to pay more attention to positions. I know the Raiders are going to need. So I, I spent a lot of time this year. The only college players I really spent a lot of time watching were quarterbacks and, and cornerbacks. So defensive backs. Um, I should have paid more attention to the interior defensive linemen, but we, that's why we bring on guests too that are experts in that because we don't have to be, they can be right. So we'll have hoping to get Chrissy back on uh, next week after the combine to give her us uh, her thoughts on the quarterbacks and how they performed. We do know Caleb Williams, not throwing and also Jaden Daniels, not throwing. And for those of you who say, well, uh, Caleb Williams, not throwing Oh, see, no, dude, you're the first pick. You have nothing to yeah. prove. If you're the first pick, all you can do is hurt yourself. So it makes no sense. Even though Caleb Williams no longer has an agent, he's smart. He he is the first pick. So guess what? I don't have to do crap. He's going to show. He's going to do his interviews. He'll be there. We'll go to his press conference. So I'll, I'll tell you what I thought of him. But but that's it. So so we'll see what happens there. But but Mo, just know you were missed. Uh, so make sure you follow him up on X. Follow me at LV Gully. The show is SNB today. I do appreciate the concern though. Of course, people love you. They they love you. They're they're. 
they're buying their Midtown Mo sweatshirts. They're having a good time. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you that th you were talking about it too, this time of the year, the conversations, people like, I don't do mock drafts. I've never done mock drafts. I know you do. It was part of your, your job at, uh, at Bleach Report covering them. And that's part of the reason it's like, I kind of gi will give you my opinions on what I think will happen, but like, I just, I don't have the, I don't have the, I think knowledge, nor do I have, um, uh, the, the idea of to go through a whole drive. I respect people like you who do it because it takes, people don't realize even though it's just a guess, educated guess, it takes a lot of work. I've been doing these position breakdowns for for teams in the combine. Like, hey, if you're a Cowboys fan, Cowboys need a center, right? It's actually the best center draft in like 25 years, by the way. But they need a center. I don't know anything about centers. So it takes time to research, right? You and I don't do these quick hit stories usually. So we're, we're, we're spending time on researching it. So you do those position breakdowns, you start to do it. So to do a draft... People complain like, well, you don't know anything. You're doing a mock draft. That's ridiculous. It's like P websites like where you work, Mo, at Bleach Report or or where I work at Sports Not. We wouldn't do them if people didn't read them. So mm -hmm. so there are people who don't like them. Totally cool. Like I got no problem with that. People, you, you that's the great thing about the way the internet now is with football is you find what you want. You're a film junkie. You're in that small audience of people who are really into film junkie. There's great stuff out there great stuff even in rate you know in the raiderdom there's great content creators who do stuff like tape don't lie those guys they do great stuff like that is of interest to certain people so anyway but we're going to focus on what we focus on here as the raiders get ready for the combine um and we talked about it earlier that deals are made here the the comments too we'll get back to some antonio Pierre. we talked about the chief's comments before the break but the other comments that he had this week mo cons were concerning well not even comments but they there was a couple stories that that came out. Tony Pauline had another story about the Raiders and that maybe Tom Telesco and, a, and, and a, AP were not on the same page with quarterbacks, that Pierce was leaning towards Aiden O'Connell and that Telesco wants a big name. But then you have reports where Pierce says, hey, if we got to be aggressive, we got to go get a quarterback. Pierce also said he wanted to bring in more quarterbacks to compete and that Aiden O'Connell would have a chance to compete for the starting job. So you kind of have to look at those things. People get get upset because they see conflicting reports to pay, depending on people's sources and whatnot. The way I look at it this way, Mo, is the fact that if you look at what all of them have said, they want to get better. They want to create competition. How that nets out, could that be drafting a guy in the first round? Yes. Could that be signing a free agent like Gardner Minshew or even though I don't think they should, Russell Wilson? Yes. Could it be uh, they go get another veteran like a Jacoby Brissett? Yes. I know. Not exciting. Uh, or could they draft a guy in the second, third round again and bring them in to compete? All of those things could be true. When you look at those reports and you think about the Raiders, we don't know what their plan is. We do know that they need to bring in, I think, at least two more quarterbacks, veterans, rookies, whatever, to compete with, with Aiden O'Connell. Uh, and, and that is how you get better. We know the Raiders need a more dynamic playmaking quarterback. So it seems like Jimmy Garoppolo on his way out. Jimmy Garoppolo, the league will suspend Jimmy Garoppolo for two games for a PED suspension. Raiders can recoup some money on his contract, likely because of that. Jimmy Garoppolo likely out of the door. Brian Hoyer is 58 years old. So we know <laughs> that the, the, the quarterback room is going to look different. And it may have it may have two new names to replace Jimmy Garoppolo and Brian Hoyer, respectively. So I, I agree with you. I think the Raiders are going to draft a quarterback, and is a possibly they get a veteran quarterback who knows Luke Getze's system. I think I advocated for this before Luke Getze was hired, that you always want a, a veteran quarterback who knows the system, who can kind of teach the system to the younger guys if you're going to have younger quarterbacks around. Aiden O'Connell doesn't have a full year of playing experience yet. Some of the Raiders draft the rookie quarterback. Those guys could learn from a veteran who's been around the league and seen a lot of football, seen a lot of coverages, how to read coverages. So it, it it's beneficial to have a veteran quarterback like that on the roster, probably one that could play if necessary. <laughs> uh, so I, I think it, you're right. I, I think when it's all said and done, you're going to have two new quarterbacks to replace Hoyer and Garoppolo. And on top of that, you want that quarterback to be able to compete with Aiden O'Connell for the backup role or maybe the starting job, depending on what the Raiders do in the draft. But with the quarterback position right now, I think, as I said in the, in the first segment with Luke Getze, I think he's going to want – so I think two additions mentioned, uh, possibly, Jacoby Brissett is an option. Mobile, not, not you know, 
not Lamar Jackson or anything, but a little more mobile, a little more athletic. And he's been known to do well as a fill-in spot starter. So I think he could compete with Aiden O'Connell. Then if, if your rookie is drafted in the first round back end or even the second round and he's not ready yet, he can learn from Jacoby Brissett and even Aiden sure. O'Connell since he, he has yeah. the playing experience. And I think right. that's that's the ideal situation. One thing I will say, though, about the rumors about the quarterback position. I'll go pivot in Antonio Pierce's interview. Ryan Clark directly asked him, you're sitting at 13. You're probably not in a great spot to get a top quarterback prospect. May Daniels and Caleb Williams will likely be gone. And Antonio Pierce kind of interjected and said, well, certain things have a price. So he didn't rule out trading up. He, he kind of said, well, if, if Aiden O'Connell is what you would call the worst case scenario, we'll roll with him and see what he looks like after a full off season of getting starting reps. But he, he didn't close the door on trading up for a quarterback and he didn't close the door on adding one through free agency. Yeah. Or, you know, and again, I know it seems, and, and I'm there with everybody, the prevailing thought on this one, but Luke Getze, when Luke Getze came over, we kind of said, well, there goes Justin Fields. Don't necessarily count it out either. I mean, there, you don't know what could happen there. Also, and I know people are going to blast me. And, and I'm, again, we talk about this, Mo. You put your opinion out. You put your opinion out there. And, 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 and when you don't put your opinion, you're safe. But when you put it out there, people call you crazy. But I'm just saying, I made in my bold predictions on New Year's Day that the Raiders would bring Jameis Winston in the camp. I, I'm just saying, I know the turnovers scare the hell out of everybody, and they should. But as a veteran there, you just never know. So. Uh, I just want to get everybody fired up there. So we'll see how. It goes. <laughs> but one of the things, too, that we look at the combine and I talked to you and we talked about the draft in the first segment was around, hey, if they don't go quarterback in the first round, right, which to me would be a bummer. But if they don't and they can't, you know, they're not going to they're not going to do something crazy and trade away everybody in the world to get a quarterback. I get that. So if they can't move up and it's too competitive and they got to stick at 13 or they can move up a couple spots or move down a couple spots and address other needs. You talked about the offensive line, huge, huge. But if they don't get their quote unquote franchise guy quarterback, I think that they, they can still get good offensive linemen in the, in the second round and they might be able to make some moves to get another second round pick. So I look at the cornerback class and I say to myself, boy, if, if I can get up and get one of these top cornerbacks, Mo, um, then I'm going to do this. And let me, let me bring up the story I did here. If I can, if I can get, uh, there we go. Um, boom. Where are, oh, there we are. We're down there. Okay. So if I can get, if I can get, um, one of these quarterbacks. So I did a story on five cornerbacks that the Raiders, that Raiders fans should watch at the combine. And some of these names, of course, uh, one of which you, you named, of course, but you have Cooper DeJean, DeJean from Iowa. You have uh, Nate Wiggins from Clemson, who seems to be very, very popular. Kool-Aid McKinstry, best name ever. Uh, Alabama, of course, there's two Alabama guys. Uh, I, and you have Kamari Lassiter. I didn't have your guy on this list, by the way, Mo. Um, but Quinion Mitchell, another guy that just did amazing at the at the uh, Senior Bowl, is a guy that I really like and I think fits in well with the Raiders and their system and their attitude, by the way. But you look at this, Mo, and you start to think, well, if the Raiders don't go quarterback, and they're able to do something uh, uh, different when it comes to uh, the first round than offensive linemen, cornerbacks. But you look at this class, Mo. I look at I look at those top five guys, including your guy from Alabama, six guys. And I think, boy, I think all of them. Now, the chances that all of them are just, you know, all pro type guys in their first year, of course, not going to happen. But I look at all six of those guys. And I think they're difference makers. And I look at the Raiders' defense. Here's my logic. So poke holes in it. My logic is this defense isn't far, right? You look at what Jack Jones did. You add another a young cornerback there, bring in another veteran for depth, whatever you got to do. You're pretty okay at safety. You might address that too. Then you're going to address the defensive line interior also in the draft and free agency. Um, I think the defense is so close to being more dominant than where the offense is at that um i would go there tell me tell me why offensive line there instead of cornerback with this class specifically with these guys who i think are all elite players i'll reiterate reiterate my point for earlier if you listen to Antonio to antonio pierce talk he wants to build a bully mm -hmm. and the way you you don't do that by adding a cornerback now you can have a physical cornerback who can help in the run game and and that plays into the mentality of we're going to be a physical football team 
from the front line to the back end. But typically, if you want to build a strong contender, if you if you hear Luke Getzey, you want you want to be a strong, confident team. You hear Antonio Pierce, we want to we want to be physical. You do that in the trenches. You don't do that through the secondary. So that and, and the Raiders again have three offensive linemen who are set to become free agents. Mm-hmm. Three of them. They have more depth at cornerback in the defensive backfield than they do on the offensive line. Again, you're going to lose three guys who were primary stars along the, along that offensive line. And I don't think they're going to bring two of, of the three back. I can see Jermaine Luminar coming back. I don't see Andre James or Greg Van Roten, who's a little older. Greg, Roten, not that Greg Van Roten was horrible. But he's 33, 34 years old. Yeah. So even if you bring Greg Van Roten back, you're still going to draft an interior offensive line because he's 33, 34 years old. So I, I think I strongly – well, I I wouldn't poo-poo or say, oh, this is a bummer. They drafted the, a top quarterback prospect. I'm not against it. But what I'm saying is your bigger need to me is across, is across the offensive line. And if you're addressing by need, I know people like to say BPA, BPA, best pay available – but roster need does factor into BPA. Absolutely. And in, and in my opinion, the offensive line is a bigger need for the Raiders right now. Yeah, no, I, and I, I think that's good. I, I, and I look, at, I look at the top prospects on offensive line, and, and the guy I think, the only guy that would be there, if you look at the top five when it comes to tackles, particularly, like you're saying, I think probably Latham is the guy that's there. Now, unless a team loves him, and he's a great player, don't get me wrong, Latham, Mims, some of those guys, so the, the the SEC guys, of course, Latham is Alabama, Mims is Georgia, um, and so yeah, it would be a hard decision. I just look at the uh, the AFC West though, too. To your point, you're right. We talked about it earlier. Build in the trenches. He wants to be a physical football team, but you're also going to be in a in in a division where if Denver can address, we don't know if they can. If they address the quarterback position, and and Sean Payton, knowing we know about him, then suddenly that that division with the quarterbacks and the offenses you have in that division you need to be cognizant of that too but of course like you said uh if if you're going to score and if you're going to build an offense then you have to have those guys up front when you look at that offense who are you going to watch because like i said i mean you look at fuaga you look at fashnu alt gaden those guys are all going to be gone by the time the raiders pick at 13 if they don't move up or if they if they stay where they're at um who else do you look at a tackle besides those two guys that i talked about with latham and mims um, I mean, to me, Latham is the guy if the Raiders go that way and he's there. Six six, he's a monster of a man. So putting him on the other side of Colton Miller to me makes a lot of sense. Uh, who else pokes out at you? So a lot of I, I, I've heard some pushback on Latham because he's from Alabama and the Raiders whiffed on Alex Leatherwood. It can can we cares? stop the helmet scouting? That's, uh, we that's we have to we have yeah we have to stop the helmet scouting. Yes, but I, I will say the guy that I'm looking at is is guy out of out of Oklahoma. Uh, I okay. I think that he had a strong senior bowl. A lot of B, uh, our BR guys, well, my BR colleagues were out there at the senior bowl and Guyton stood out. Mm-hmm. And the one question about Guyton was can he anchor and he did well in that area at the se- during the senior bowl practices. So I think he's going to fly up boards. He was considered a I, I wasn't considered a top 10 pick but could be now that he's gaining some steam. Yeah. I think that's a guy that the Raiders will at uh, Rosengarten, Rosengarten is another guy yeah. that could be on the Raiders' radar as a day two prospect. But I will also say this, that the offensive tackle class is not going to be that strong in free agency. You're going to have Trent mm-hmm. Brown, Michael Owen, who I talked about in a previous show, available. Uh, if the, And offensive, typically solid or high-end offensive tackles aren't available in free agency. So typically, if you need an offensive tackle, you're going to address that through the draft. So I think with the Raiders, they may get an offensive tackle, but he may be a borderline starter. And that's why I think they address offensive tackle first if it's not cornerback in the first round. And I mentioned two guys today, just now. Guyton and Rosengarten. I think those are the two guys you look at, Guyton in the first round, Rosengarten on day two. Mm -hmm. Now, I I will also say that there are some guys in my BR folks have said this and from the scouting department that there are going to be some tackles who are going to be considered guards yeah you know there's always a top offensive team uh scouts will question is he a tackle is he a guard teams may move him inside they feel like he translates better as a guard just something to note because if the raiders draft a guy and he's listed as a tackle he and he has some versatility at guard i think that's valuable because now if you bring back jermaine luminar you can kind of interchange those two guys and whoever fits best at guard and tackle going forward 
Yeah, and it's interesting you bring up Guyton because he's so small at six seven. I mean, <laughs> this guy is a mountain of a man. That's that's why that's why I like Latham too. I mean, he's six six. He's only an inch shorter. These are big dudes. Guyton interests me too, Mo, because of uh, I did watch some tape on him actually that you mentioned it now after the Senior Bowl, which is he is a monster in pass protection. So. Think about it this way. If if you don't get that quarterback in the first round and you're uncertain and they, we, we don't know what they're going to do in free agency. Free agency comes before the draft, remember. So the Raiders may address the quarterback position in free agency or via a trade. So we'll see. It could change a lot of things. But to me, if they go into the season and they go get a Jacoby Brissett and somebody else and Aiden O'Connell, with O'Connell being mobily challenged, <laughs> I don't want to criticize him because people will hate on me, but – Mobily challenged. <laughs> He's not functionally mo moe bull. Okay, so to me that that points out wow between him and Miller from a pass protection perspective. If you're going to have a quarterback that doesn't exactly have wheels back there, a guy like Guyton, man, I mean, I think he can come in instantly and be good. I know it's the NFL, but I think he can be good. He's not that he's not good in the run either. But from a pass protection perspective, he might be the best guy in the draft if you look at it. I mean, overall. And so, so that might be something to keep an eye on as well. Here's the other thing, and I and I don't want to get on my soapbox about this, but I, <laughs> I see mock drafts where, and I get it, not everyone is into the schematics of building a football team. But if you know, or if you if you have the idea that the Raiders could run a lot of outside zone runs, yes, you don't necessarily need a mauler. So a lot of people like right. to say this guy is. Not you, Scott, but a lot of people say, oh, this guy is 6'7", 350 pounds. You need a people mover. With outside zone runs, you necessarily don't need a, a mauler. Yeah. You need a guy who's going to be able to get to a spot and block an area, not necessarily gap gap block. And I think there people need to understand there's a difference between the two schematics and you need yeah. the, the best fit. So if you're looking at collegiate prospects, I would look at guys who are better as zone blocking guys versus mm -hmm. not to say that you don't need a mauler. But I think the Raiders are going to go after a guy who's more athletic, kind of like Colton Miller type. When Colton Miller came out of UCLA, wasn't known as a molar, was no more of his athletic but, uh, tackle. And I think that's yes. what the Raiders are going to look for in this, this year's draft. But that's the thing with Latham and Guyton, both huge men, okay? But, can but both incredibly mobile. They can move. They're very athletic. And I think that's why when you see a guy that big who has that kind of footwork who can move – like you said, in the zone blocking scheme, that's like, wow. I mean, and, and Guyton, I, depending to your point, he's rising up charts, so he might end up. But the Raiders, depending what happens, again, it's all just guesses. But they could even move down and get a guy like that and, and pick up another second-round pick or something, depending on what's going on. So those are all kind of things we got to watch on there. It's going to be It's going to be interesting to watch all of it for sure as we move forward with that as well. Uh, but I, I, I look at the Raiders at the combine and, and I'm going to see what, what they really focus in on. You'll get, like I said, we'll get some hints. They're very protective too. They're not going to, they're not going to let too much information out, uh, but we'll be there uh, amongst all, all of the throngs of, of media folks to figure it all out. But it's going to be an interesting week. We'll at least have some news and some idea of what's going on with the Raiders here too. And uh, I'm just interested to be in the hallways not only at the convention center and the stadium when the workouts are happening, but then after hours in the restaurants when you get to talk to some people and maybe hear a little bit of this and that, and then we'll bring it all to you. Um, but it's it's going to be fun, and we'll be there all for it. Mo, what do you got going this week, too, uh, for for the Combine, for Raiders content when it comes to Sports Not and for Bleacher Report? Well, shout out to everybody who joined my Bleach Report live on Monday, where I talked about five prospects the Raiders should look at going into the combine. This week, I will have a combine column over at Sports Now, talking about five guys that the Raiders should look at. Maybe some guys that I mentioned in Monday's live, maybe mm. repeated in writing, just for the people who didn't catch the show. Uh, and then I'll, I'll kind of mellow out and continue to study and continue to look at offensive tackles, cornerbacks. Obviously, the quarterback position is paramount. But I also look at interior offensive linemen. I also look at some linebackers, some running backs, because Luke Getze ran a lot of personnel with two running backs on the field. I also look at tight ends, he used multiple tight ends in Chicago. So those are running back and tight end, although they're not top needs. I think the Raiders are going to address both positions 
on day two or day three in the draft just to kind of fill the not the back end of the roster, but guys who could be in rotation for the offense. Very nice. Make sure you follow Mo on X.com at Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. And get that Bleacher Report app so you can watch him live because he doesn't like to be lonely. You know, keep, <laughs> keep him company on there as well as read his content up there. Of course, sportsnot.com. Uh, we 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 always retweet all his stuff too, so make sure you're up there as well. Mo, one thing too, re real quick before we check out uh, for this episode uh, of Silver and Black today, early this week, is the Raiders. You know, we haven't heard uh, any any information on franchise tags. You know, the Josh Jacobs things we talked about that last episode last week, um, but there hasn't been any movement there. They don't have to do anything yet. They could start to do it last week. Um, but we haven't heard anything. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what the scuttlebutt is in Indianapolis around that. We are seeing a lot of teams and a lot of other journalists from around the league talking about Josh Jacobs being a fit for their team, whether it was the, the Saints, Cowboys. the Cowboys, Cowboys, also the Chargers in the division. So so there's talk going out there. Uh, and, and I think that that's one guy, even though the Raiders have 15 free agents technically. You look at Josh Jacobs, he's at the top of the list uh, and see what happened. I don't think we're going to see resolution of that anytime soon. Do you? I don't think so either. I didn't expect the I don't expect the Raiders to franchise tag him. Tashawn Reed, I believe, put out a column over the athletics saying that the Raiders have not uh, engaged in extension talks with him yet. That doesn't mean that they won't eventually. Right. There's still a lot of time. But I think it's going to come down to price as it as it does with most of these free agents, uh, impending free agents. What does Josh Jacobs want as far as his contract and what other Raiders willing to pay him? What is Tom Telesco's number? What is his price range? And from there, I think that's what they'll 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 move on from there. But I, if Josh Jacobs is resigned, it'll probably happen, you know, a few days before free agency opens. It could come down to the wire. If he does test the market, it, it could be a, a situation where he wants to see what he can earn and then compare it to what the Raiders are offering before he makes a decision. Yes, absolutely. Now it'll be it'll be it'll be interesting to to say the least. A lot of discussion around that. I've had a lot of discussion with listeners who are are trying to make the point that Josh Jacobs um, that he should get a longer contract that he doesn't show any uh, any wear and tear that would mean that he can't play another three years. I disagree with that. I think you look at the 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 team and excuse me the data around running backs and, and it's not against Josh Jacobs. It's just a fact. It's just and I mentioned on the last we had a listener by the way who is an actuary and he was impressed that I actually knew what an actuary was. But nonetheless, you look at the numbers and it just completely falls off. Again, there's always outliers, uh, but you look at Josh Jacobs and his history with injury and stuff like that. It's just hard. Uh, it doesn't mean he won't be back. Like you, but you had a great piece on Sports Not last week about why he might be back. And, and I invite people to go read that as well. But we'll see how it all rolls down. By the way, we uh, will attempt to get another mailbag in next week. I already got a couple calls. I'm waiting for Jacob and Fresno. Hello, go, go, go. No, just kidding. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. we have. Uh, if you're watching us <laughs> on YouTube, we're giving you the number down there, 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Uh, make sure, tell us where you're calling from, your name, and leave your message. Uh, you know, a minute, minute and a half is good. Uh, try not to leave five minute messages because then it just gets tough. And sometimes it gets cut off and I can't get your whole message and then I can't use it. So please do that. If you really want to mail us, email us, you can do that at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. But we uh, we love to have you guys on. So make sure you do that. And then uh, also make sure you subscribe to the channel and to the podcast. I forgot to remind everybody at the beginning, wherever you get your audio, look for Silver and Black today. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you hit subscribe and that notifications bell. And also a thumbs up as well, because that'll make Mo feel really good. That makes us all feel good. Uh, so anyway, but Mo, I will catch up with you again later in the week from Indianapolis. Hopefully have some fun we can talk about and um, maybe even some surprise guests that you may or may not know. Sounds good. I, I, I look forward to some of the faces that you might see out there. And I know they'll say, where's Mo? All you have to do is say yes. he's in a cave somewhere he's on the Northeast cave. Coast. Yeah. I mean, that bracelet won't let him, the anklet won't let him out of the house. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, those bright, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. No. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I already know our good buddy Jarrett Jay Bailey will be up there as well as Antoine Staley. And of course, Q Myers, my former partner. I have not seen him in a couple of years. So looking forward to, to catching up with all those guys and hopefully uh, have them stop by on the show and have some fun. Uh, but uh, we will do that again later in the week on Thursday. Mo, have a great rest one, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. 
All right, for everybody here at Silver and Black today, including our producer, Mike Robier, you talk about a guy in a cave. No, I'm just kidding. He is uh, the guy who keeps it all together. So we appreciate him very much, as well as everybody at Odyssey who brings this show to you. But for Mo, I'm Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black today. We'll talk to you from the Combine on Thursday. Take care, everybody. All right.